Okay, great. So our next talk is uh, Cole Hugemeyer, and he's going to tell us about the inscribed space, uh, sorry, square problem. I can't read. Thank you so much. It's absolutely amazing to be here and to listen to all these phenomenal talks and to celebrate Tom's birthday. Uh, I'm really excited to tell you all about this new approach to the inscribed square problem that I've been thinking a lot about. So just a little bit of background. The inscribed square problem is this 111-year-old conjecture due to Toplitz in 1911. And it's just the statement that if I have any simple closed curve in the plane, I can find four points on that curve that form the vertices of a square. Now, this is a really hard problem, but if we restrict gamma to being in some nice regularity class, uh, it becomes significantly easier. So we do have the following theorem uh, due to Schnellman back in 1929, okay, which if, is that if gamma is smooth, that implies there is, in fact, a uh, square. All right, so if gamma is smooth, we can find a square. So how do we go about proving something like this? Well, I'm going to define a configuration space, which I'm going to call C4 tilde of R squared. And what this is, is it's the set of cyclically ordered quadruples of distinct points. in R2. All right, so just to clarify exactly what I mean by this, uh, we can define this as a quotient space of sort of the standard configuration space. So this would be C4 of R2, and this is just quadruples of distinct points in R2 that are ordered, so this is just an open subset of R to the 8, and we're going to mod out by a Z mod 4Z action, all right, which corresponds to just cyclically permuting the coordinates of the couple, okay? Uh, so this is a manifold, and we're interested in two specific subspaces of this manifold. Uh, we're interested in SQ, which is going to be the set of counterclockwise squares. So since the couples are cyclically ordered, if we have a square, we're getting some cyclic order on the vertices, and I'm just letting this be the set of squares where the cyclic order is consistent with the counterclockwise order of the vertices. Um, and then we also have C4 tilde of gamma. All right. So um, this uh, actually has three connected components because I'm not requiring that the four points uh, be consistent with the cyclic order on gamma, and there are two sort of distinct ways to put a pair of cyclic orders on four points. So in particular, uh, we're interested in the intersection of these two spaces. So I'm just going to define inscribed squares of gamma to be the intersection, square intersect C4 tilde of gamma. All right. So this is the thing that we're trying to prove is not empty. And in the case where gamma is smooth, these are both smooth submanifolds of this manifold, and they're both dimension four. This is dimension eight. So we expect there to be some you know, distinct set of intersection points for these things, and we should be able to count the intersection parity, morally speaking. There are some complications with this. First of all, these are not compact manifolds. So uh, there's that issue. Um, and second of all, the uh, sort of typical differential topology that you would want to use to calculate an intersection parity breaks down a little bit here. And the way it breaks down is that if we were to take the set of all possible small perturbations of a smooth Jordan curve uh, and then see what happens to C4 tilde of gamma, we don't actually get all small perturbations of that smooth manifold. So you can't just say, let's just take a small perturbation um, and then apply the standard uh, transversality theory because you don't have all small perturbations. So you actually technically have to build transversality theory sort of from the ground up for these specific situations. And that wasn't done until relatively recently. So I'm going to So that was done by uh, Cantrell Denim McCleary in 2014. And I'll just say relevant transversality theory.
you know, obviously um, back in 1929, there wasn't any transversality theory at all. So, you know, he did it with just uh, like explicit like coordinates and stuff like that. It was a really big proof. But now that we have machinery like this, it's, it's actually really easy to just explain how to prove uh, this, this fact for uh, smooth curves. So what we can do is we can define uh, gamma to be generic if it has the following two properties. Um, it's smooth, and we have a transverse intersection between squares and the configuration space. All right? So this is what it means for a Jordan curve to be generic in my book. And there's a few nice facts about generic Jordan curves which is uh, a corollary of the transversality theorem in configuration spaces. So facts, all right? One of them is that they're C infinity dense. So given any smooth Jordan curve, we can approximate it arbitrarily well with generic curves. Uh, and the other ones, the other fact is that they have generic isotopes between them. So uh, in particular, what's important about these generic isotopies is that they uh, induce one-manifold bordisms on inscribed squares, all right? So uh, if we have two Jordan curves, right, we'll have some squares over here, and we'll have some squares over here, and then the set of inscribed squares is going to be some one-manifold when we isotope between these things, all right? So what that means is that uh, the, the number of inscribed squares in a generic Jordan curve is actually invariant uh, under parity. So more specifically, we can say that the homology class of inscribed squares of gamma is well defined as an element of H0, C4 tilde of gamma, uh, with coefficients in Z mod 2Z. Right. Also in Z, but uh, we don't care about that. So I mentioned earlier that this manifold has three connected components. So that actually corresponds to there being three different kinds of inscribed squares that we can have in a Jordan curve. And uh, let's just draw what they look like. There's what I call the type one squares, which are the sort of obvious type where we just like go through all four vertices in a circle. There's the type two squares. Oh, I should say these, these are also called bracing squares. Bracing squares. That terminology is due to Rich Schwartz. So there's also the type two squares where we go through the vertices in a zigzag, all right, like this. And there's the type three squares where uh, they go through the vertices in the opposite cyclic order from what we're supposed to. So it goes like this. So these are the three different kinds of inscribed squares. And each of these individual types of inscribed squares has its own parity for generic Jordan curves, uh, which is invariant for all generic Jordan curves. So uh, let's calculate those parities. We need an example of generic Jordan curve. Uh, and any ellipse, which is not a circle, is generic. Uh, and this has exactly one inscribed square, which is grace. So what that tells us is that this is always odd. This is always even. And this is always even in any generic Jordan curve. All right, so we understand generic Jordan curves. That's nice. But what about non-generic? So let's let gamma be non-generic. There's this uh, attempted argument that you can make for non-generic Jordan curves, which goes something like this. We're going to take generic Jordan curves, gamma 1, gamma 2, dot, 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 uh, and they're going to approach gamma in some sense. And we know that all of these generic Jordan curves have inscribed squares, and particularly they have uh, gracing squares. So we can let S1, S2, dot, 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 be gracing squares inscribed in these Jordan curves. Uh, and although these might not approach anything, they're all within some bounded region in space, right? So we can uh, take a convergent subsequence. So we can take a subsequence that converges to some square S. And then we have an inscribed squares in gamma, and then we're done, and we solve the inscribed square problem. Um, 
Uh, that's, that's exactly what I'm about to talk about. <laughs> so so you, can, you can, of course, uh, approximate any continuous curve with smooth curves in the you know, C0 topology, right? So if I can approximate smooth curves with generic curves, then I can approximate anything with generic curves in C0, right? So, so um, you can do this. But the, but the issue is that when you take this convergent subsequence, the squares might shrink down to a point. And that might sound like a trivial sort of technicality with this argument, but it's actually super important. And it's the, the thing that makes the inscribed square problem so hard, is the fact that this convergent subsequence of squares can shrink down to a point rather than a actually non-trivial square. So you can get around this issue for certain regularity classes. Um, and the way you do that is by selecting these generic approximates in such a way that there's an epsilon greater than zero so that no squares of size epsilon or smaller appear in any of those generic approximates. So like if we were to have, say, a corner in uh, gamma here, so it's not generic, of course, it's not smooth, we can take these sort of smooth approximations that look like, like a hyperbola locally, and they won't have any inscribed squares. Look, like there's no inscribed squares within this part of the picture. So there's no small inscribed squares in a smoothing of a piecewise linear curve. And you can do this sort of argument for all sorts of regularity classes. As I just pointed out, you can do it for piecewise linear. You can do it for C1. And you can do it for piecewise C1 with no cusps. And some other uh, classes as well. Um, piecewise C1 with no cusps, that means that when I'm connecting two pieces of two C1 curves, at the spot where they're connected, uh, I'm not allowed to have the derivatives be like uh, negatives of each other. So I'm not allowed to, like in C1, I can have like lots of little like loops like this. So I'm not allowed to have something like this in, in, a, in a no cusp piecewise C1, because that would be able to have small squares. So yeah, so what's, what's important about all of these classes is A, that we've solved the inscribed square problem for them, and B, that they have no small squares. So I call this the small square barrier. And it's, um, it's like uh, the really hard, it's the separating wall between the, between the regularity classes that we can solve the problem for and the regularity classes where we can't solve the problem for. Um, there are some things that technically break the small square barrier, but they don't break the gracing small square barrier. So an example of that would be curves that locally look like the graph of some continuous function for some choice of coordinates, right? So they would, we could have like lots of zigzags like this that go all the way around, and they could be like fractal zigzags. And as long as we can choose coordinates at any point so that um, it passes the vertical line test locally, you can't have gracing squares. You can have, you can have inscribed type two squares locally, but you can't have gracing squares. So that would, that would still, you'd be able to apply this argument. Um, and uh, I like the breaking the small square barrier is really hard. Um, and when we're like facing a, such a difficult problem, sometimes the right way to deal with it is to look at the sort of simplest case where everything breaks down horribly. So I have a regularity class that I've been focusing on, which I call ACS for arbitrarily complicated singularities, but. Uh, it's a fairly simple regularity class. This is just curves which are smooth, except at finitely many points. All right, so that's ACS, curves which are smooth except at finitely many points. And crucially, the reason I'm calling it arbitrarily complicated singularities is we have no restriction on the regularity for these curves near the bad points. So I want you to imagine just like a spiral where the two strands are coming into each other, and then there's like smaller spirals as we zoom in, and those spirals wrap around each other worse and worse and worse, just like exponentially fast as we zoom into that point. So I'm not gonna attempt to draw something that terrible, but I want you to, I'll just draw like this. So this is a curve in ACS, all right? So we'd have some point where everything gets terrible, and maybe a few, other of, a few other such points, but finally many. So if you can solve the inscribed square problem for these curves, you can, you can break the small square barrier. So it would be a really big deal if we could solve this inscribed square problem for ACS. Um, and I have an idea of how to do this. 
Uh, and I've somehow convinced myself that the key to solving the inscribed square problem for this class lies in sort of a, uh, as far as I know, unexplored area of mathematics. And that's essentially the, uh, the connection I want to show you guys in this talk today, um, which is relation avoiding paths. So uh, in particular, what, we're going to have a vector space, V, which is going to be a vector space over the complex numbers, uh, finite dimensional. And we're going to have relations, R1, R2, dot, dot, dot. And these are all, finally many of them, Rn. And these are all going to be linear subspaces of V times V. Okay. And what is a relation avoiding path? A relation avoiding path is just a continuous path in V, which has the property that no two points of that path are related. So uh, in particular, I'm interested in relation avoiding paths that sort of approach the origin of V. So I'm going to define a relation avoiding origin path to be some function P, which goes from 0 infinity to V continuously. And it's going to have the following two properties. It's going to have the property that if I limit as t goes to infinity of p of t, that gives me 0. And it's going to have the property um, that there does not exist any pair of times t1, t2, so that p of t1 is related by any of my relations to p of t2. All right, so this is a relation avoiding origin path. All right, now I, I really want to show you guys how this is related to the inscribed square problem, but um, you know, this is a new concept to me, let alone you guys, so I think it's worthwhile to go over a couple examples of these paths to sort of get a feel for how these objects behave. So we're going to do example one, and for all these examples, we're just going to be looking at the one-dimensional case. So V is just C, right? So what is our relation that we're going to be avoiding? Let's start with something simple. x plus y equals 0. This is a relation. So two things are related if they're negatives of each other. And let's uh, try to figure out what it means for a path to avoid this relation. Well, if I have a path that sort of approaches the origin, I want none of these points to be the negative of any other point. So that's the same as if we take this path and we rotate it 180 degrees around the origin. We want this path and this path to be disjoint from one another. And that's the same as avoiding this relation. All right. So let's take a step back. And, and suppose we're trying to make a relation avoiding path. And we're going to start at 1 in the complex plane. And our eventual goal is to reach 0. From here, all we really know is that we're never allowed to touch the point negative 1. Right? But we immediately see something interesting here, which is that there's infinitely many homotopy types of path from 1 to 0 that avoid negative 1, right? We've already exhibited 1. We could just go straight there, and then that would give us a relation avoiding path. But then you could ask the question, are there relation avoiding paths from 1 to 0 that wrap around negative 1? And if you try to, try to find one, right, we'll just do this, you immediately see that it, it, the answer is probably no, right? This crosses. So um, it's not that hard to prove that it's impossible to find such a relation avoiding path. Just a sketch of the idea here as to why it's impossible. Here's one, here's negative one. If we try to wrap around negative one, then this path is going to go over here. And now we have to wrap around this whole thing because we're not allowed to touch it. So we have to go all the way over here. And now this is going to wrap all the way over here. And you can see that you just get stuck in this infinite loop of spiraling farther and farther away from the origin. So in this case, there's only one homotopy class of path from one to zero for the relation avoiding paths. OK, so we've solved this example. Let's look at another example. I'm just going to erase all of this here so that we have some space. All right. So we have example two. Here we're going to just look at. Uh, x plus 2y equals 0. So in this case, we 
have our plane, and we have one. We're just going to start at one again. Now there's two points we have to avoid. It's going to be negative one half and negative two. All right. But for the same reason as that we can't wrap around negative one, we can't wrap around negative two either, because we'd spiral farther and farther away. So we can just ignore that. So what types of homotopy paths can we get wrapping around negative one half? And you can see that if you sort of wrap around and get a little bit closer, then this will get smaller, and you can actually spiral into the origin with both of these paths. And you can wrap around as many times as you want using these spirals. So you can actually get all homotopy types of path if you're avoiding this relation. So clearly, something interesting is happening, because what homotopy types of path we can get depend on what relations we avoid. So uh, this is already a little bit interesting. But um, in my definition, I had multiple relations. So let's see what happens when I have multiple relations. We have the relation x plus 2y equals 0. And we have the relation x plus 3y equals 0. So in this case, we, have to, we start at 1, right? And we have to avoid negative 1 half and negative 1 third, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw four of these homotopy types. And you guys can just guess to yourselves which ones you think are going to be relation avoiding uh, and which ones you think will have no path in that homotopy class, which is relation avoiding. And you guys can quiz yourself to see how many you get right, <laughs> just for fun. So here's one homotopy class. We go between them, and then we go to the origin. Here's another one. We go around, but we go between them up, and we go back to the origin. Another thing we can do is we could wrap around once and then go between them. And another thing we can do is we can wrap around once and then go between them twice. All right, so I'll give you all a second or so to make your conjectures about these uh, paths. So here's the answer. This one can be made relation avoiding. This one cannot. This one can, and this one cannot. So uh, obviously something non-trivial is happening here. Uh, and there's actually just an amazing fact about how to completely classify which curves are uh, able to be relation avoiding and which ones are not. So here is, here is the theorem. theorem. And this is uh, only in one dimension, so only for one dimensional uh, v. And here it is. The possible homotopy classes are exactly those of logarithmic spirals. So as you can see here, obviously we can make a logarithmic spiral with this homotopy class, not with this one, because we have to double backwards with this one also. And the reason we can't do it with this one is that one half and one third are actually a little bit close together. So there's actually no logarithmic spiral that will go through them twice here while only going around once here if it has to start at one. So um, yeah, so this, this is the classification of exactly which uh, relation avoiding paths in one dimension we can find. Yeah, something of the form uh, v, so I'll, I'll just say x times e to the at, where x is some you know, starting point, and then a is some complex number with negative real part. Yeah. So um, there you go. That's the solution. Um, how much time do I have? OK. I might, uh, I w I'm going to give a sketch of proof of this just really quickly. Um, so here's a sketch of proof. So for, for, we can, without loss of generality, just work inside of the unit disk. And we can assume that our starting path goes from 1 to 0. And all of the other paths, we're going to have some you know, points we have to avoid. And all of the other paths are just going to be scaled rotations of our starting path. right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take 1 over 2 pi i log of this. 
and this is going to take me to the upper half plane. So my starting path is going to become some path L, right, L, and then these are all going to be translations of L that are sort of Z periodic in here, all right? And I know they're all disjoint from L because it's relation avoiding. And what I want to prove is that there's some straight line that separates all the starting points on the left from the starting points on the right. The straight line doesn't actually have to be disjoint from these curves, it just has to separate the starting points, okay? So um, it suffices to show that any starting point on the left has argument, angle in the complex plane, greater than any starting point on the right because then such a line will exist. All right, so the way we're gonna prove that is we're going to define PQ to be what's called a, a split pair if the following is the case. P is topologically to the left of L, meaning it has a path disjoint from L to negative real infinity. Uh, Q is on the right of L. Um, and uh, P plus L, Q plus L, and L are disjoint. So the cool thing about these split pairs is that we can define a uh, operation on them which transforms one split pair to another. And I should mention that to prove the theorem we want to prove, it suffices to show that every split pair has a property that the argument of P is greater than the argument of Q. So we have this operation that takes up PQ. And what we're going to do is if the imaginary part of P is, great, is less than the imaginary part of Q, we're going to subtract P from Q. So then it's going to become P comma Q minus P. And then otherwise, it becomes P minus QP. And what does this do? Well, if we have our split pair, so here's L, here's P, here's Q, Q and P, what we're doing is we're drawing a parallelogram like this, and we're adding this one. So we're switching Q to this one, and we can see that this path is going to be on the right of this path, because the relationship between these two paths is the same as the relationship between these two paths. So that's why it works. And you'll notice that if you keep applying this operation, so we keep apply, drawing these parallelograms, what's going to happen is the paths, the points are going to get farther and farther away from each other, and one of them is going to go to negative real infinity, and one of them is going to go to positive real infinity, except in a few exceptional circumstances, um, such as the imaginary parts having rational ratio or P and Q having real ratio, which those cases can be uh, dealt with separately. And what that means is that since one of the things going to negative infinity, one of the things going to positive infinity, why does this tell us anything interesting? Well, what's interesting is that this operation preserves the invariant, which is the order of the arguments of P and Q. So, so you'll notice that, like, here's my parallelogram. If, if P and Q, if P is angularly to the left of Q, then P will angularly be to the left of Q minus P. So this preserves the order of the arguments, and then it splits them across to plus minus infinity, which means that at the beginning, they already had arguments in the right direction. So that tells us every split pair has the argument of P greater than the argument of Q, and that tells us that all of these points are to the left of some straight line compared to all of these points. So then there's a straight line, and that straight line becomes a logarithmic spiral that is in the same homotopy class as this line, and spirals in past all those points. Voila. All right. So this is a beautiful um, uh, theorem. But what does it have to do with the inscribed square problem? Well, the inscribed square problem is actually can be solved if you have a higher dimensional generalization of this fact. So I have a few conjectures about how this theorem generalizes to, uh, to, to higher dimensions. Um, and I, I'm just going to call that the spiral conjecture. And the spiral conjecture implies the inscribed square problem for this regularity class here. So here's the spiral conjecture. All right, so the spiral conjecture is if P is a relation avoiding origin path, then there exists some H, which is a homotopy from 0, 1 times 0, infinity to V. And this H has the following properties. Um, limit as t goes to infinity 
h of st is zero. I'll make this a one, two. h of zero t is p of t. This is where it's a generalized logarithmic spiral. h of one t is going to be equal to sum i goes from one to n x i e to the a i t, where um, x1 dot 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 xn are linearly independent. And a1 dot 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 an are complex numbers. All right? And then there's a fourth condition, which is sort of that it respects the homotopy class. So what this is, is that there does not exist any uh, pair st such that um, h of st is related by any of the relations to h of 0 t. So it's only having to avoid the uh, relations of the start point of the path as we homotope. And that start point is allowed to move uh, over time. So uh, I have slightly stronger versions of this conjecture as well. Um, you'll notice that it doesn't actually have to be a relation avoiding origin path for all time. So the strong uh, spiral conjecture is the statement 1 through 3 is the same. And 4 is that h of s at s is a relation avoiding origin path. All right, so this is the strong spiral conjecture. And this, in turn, is um, implied by an even stronger version, which is what I believe to be like the real fact underlying all of this, which is what I call the monotonic spiral conjecture. Now, I should mention I have not proven the, small, the strong or monotonic spiral conjectures, even in the one-dimensional case. All we have shown is the spiral conjecture in one dimension. And the monotonic spiral conjecture, um, again, 1 through 3 is the same. And I, I want to point out only codimension 1 relations matter, because in this homotopy, a small perturbation can be made to avoid anything of codimension more than 1, complex codimension 1, so that's real codimension 2. So in 4, what this is, is that the set of codimension 1 relations we avoid is increasing in S. So that means that if we avoid a relation at time S, then for all future, for all S greater than that, we also avoid that relation. So I think that we can actually not just find a homotopy that avoids the relations, but find one that just strictly increases the relations we avoid until we reach one of these spirals. And essentially, the reason these spirals are special is that they, they are sort of within this upper set of, uh, of this, this ordering, where we add an ordering on all the, all the paths based on the set of relations we avoid. And then it seems to me like these spirals are sort of um, they're not quite the maximizers. It's more like if we're only allowed to go like up in R2 with like 45 degree angles, then it's sort of like this, where there's this upper set, um, and then once we reach a certain point, we can always find a path to one of these spiral things. Um, that's, a, that's sort of a vague picture. I don't know if that made any sense at all. But um, this is kind of nice, and we have the following sequence of implications with these conjectures. So we have the monotonic spiral conjecture implies the strong spiral conjecture, implies the spiral conjecture, which in turn implies the inscribed square problem for ACS. All right, so this is great. So I've already explained these two implications, um, but let's talk about this implication for the remainder of the talk. Um, so I'm going to prove, assuming the spiral conjecture, that um, that every uh, ACS Jordan curve has an inscript square. All right. And the key theorem here, the key theorem that we're going to use, is what I call the square envelope theorem. 
So I'll just state that and then explain what I'm talking about later. All right. It's every bad Dorman curve. has a square envelope. All right, so what's a bad Jordan curve and what's a square envelope? A bad Jordan curve is just a Jordan curve that we're trying to prove doesn't exist. It's just a Jordan curve with no inscribed squares at all. So what's a square envelope? So a square envelope is a square depending on time, A of t, and then we have B, C, D, depend, uh, square, all right? These are all depending on time. And um, it has the following properties. A and B are inside gamma, gamma being our Jordan curve, and C and D are outside. Actually, I want to flip these. We have that the limit, as t goes to plus or minus infinity, uh, of the side length is 0. And we have that a and b wrap around gamma as time progresses. So what do I, let's, let's sort of draw this. They shouldn't exist, but I'm going to draw it anyway. So here we have a Jordan curve. And we start with a square over here with A and B. Here's A, B, C, D. So A and B are outside, and C and D are inside. And then somehow A and B wrap around the whole curve, all right? And then we have a small square. Uh, we have a small square over here, right, with A and B outside, C and D inside. And then somehow, while keeping it a square the whole time, C and D have to go over here which is obviously impossible, right? Obviously, if we try to move A and B around the Jordan curve, C and D are going to bump into the curve. So you'll lose property one. So, so it's, it seems completely obvious that these don't exist. And if, I mean, if you can prove they don't exist, you've solved the inscribed square problem. Um, and uh, the reason that, uh, I'll, prove, I'll prove this theorem in a moment, but first I want to show how uh, the fact that every bad Jordan curve has a square envelope tells you that ACS Jordan curves have inscribed squares. And this is actually very close to being a relation avoiding path. In particular, the set of squares, in this sense, is a, is a vector space where uh, C and D depend linearly on A and B. You can just write down linear functions that, that create C and D out of A and B. So set of squares is isomorphic as a vector space to C squared. And we have a relation, which is the sort of the right corners of one square bumping into the left corners of another square. So if, if the A and B of one square bump into the C and D of a different square, that's going to be our relation. So it's technically eight, eight different linear relations corresponding to all the ways that that could happen. OK? So we have a system of linear relations telling us when the A, B curves hit the C, D curves. And um, we have. Uh, this square envelope, which is then a relation avoiding path in this system. Okay? And you're going to notice that, that on one side you might have a normal looking square, but on the other side you're going to have a square where the curve wraps around it in a weird way. And that can never happen for a smooth curve. Like if you zoom in on a smooth curve, there's only one way to put a square here, which is like this, right, with A, B inside and C, B outside. So that means that these have to be close to your singularities. So you actually get that on one of the ends of your square envelope, you have a limit to a point. And, that, and it, without loss of generality, you can choose that point to be the origin. And you've constructed a relation avoiding origin path. And in particular, you can show that this homotopy type from the, the curve wrapping around the square in a weird way cannot be represented by a generalized logarithmic spiral. All right. So that's why the spiral conjecture implies that ACS Jordan curves have inscribed squares if we have the square envelope theorem. So in the last five minutes, I'm going to attempt to prove to you guys the square envelope theorem. All right. So we're going to let gamma, gamma be a bad Jordan curve. All right. And what we're going to do is we're going to choose a function f, 
which is positive inside and negative outside and zero on the curve. Okay, we can of course do this and we can make f continuous. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna define C1 and C2 of AB and C2 of AB to be the linear functions that construct C and D out of A and B, all right? So if I have A and B, this is C1 and this is C2 of these two. They're just linear functions. And um, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to create a, a map, which I'm gonna call phi, and this map goes from distinct points on the, on the Jordan curve, so this is just points on the Jordan curve minus the diagonal, and it's gonna map to uh, r squared minus the origin. And what the map does is it takes the point x comma y, and it maps it to f of c1 of xy, f of c2 of xy. And you'll notice what's special about this map is that if it, if it were to be zero, we would have an inscribed square, right? Yeah? What is f? Oh, sorry, f is a function that's positive inside the Jordan curve and negative outside, and zero on the curve. So, so if we were to have um, a point where it's zero, where, where this function phi is zero, that would correspond to an inscribed square. All right, so this is a map from a cylinder to a cylinder topologically. So it actually has uh, some sort of homotopy type that we can calculate. So I'm gonna call that the bad wrapping number. And you can calculate um, the bad wrapping number. You can just do some, some calculations using generic approximates. And uh, the wrapping number is actually equal to the parity of type one squares uh, plus the parity of type three squares. All right? In any generic Jordan curve, which is then equal to one. So uh, we know that, the bad, that, this, that this map between cylinders wraps around an odd number of times. So how is this at all useful? Well, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna look in r squared minus the origin at this quadrant q, the upper right quadrant, right? And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna look at the inverse image, I'm gonna look at phi inverse of q, all right? So here we have my, our cylinder, uh, gamma squared minus the diagonal, and we're gonna have some sort of set q here. And what I know about q, since I know that this map is, is, is essential, I know that there cannot be any loop which wraps around the, the cylinder that is disjoint from Q, right? Because such a loop would then wrap around the origin and would touch Q, right? So what I can say by Poincaré duality is that within this open set, there is a function from R to this open set that goes between the endpoints of the cylinder. That's a square envelope. Well, it's almost a square envelope. What is it really? It's, we have our Jordan curve and it's a square with two corners on the outside and the other two corners inside because, they because S, F has to be positive on both of those corners. And for it to go from the bottom to the top of the cylinder, these points have to wrap around the curve. So we can just push these points off the, off the curve slightly and then that gives us a square envelope. So there you go, that completes the proof. Um, I think I'm done. Yeah? Oh yeah, so here's, here's why you need one more than, more than one. There's actually some examples of specific systems where you need more than one. And you can, there's a notion of taking a product of one of these relation systems. So you basically just take a Cartesian product and then it's just two relation systems independently. And you can, you can choose homotopy classes so that those relations independently have to have like different exponents for their logarithmic spirals, right? So in that case, you can, you can make, you can make, yeah. Yeah. 
Oh, well, it, it, it can't be bigger because xi have to be linearly independent. Yeah. Any other questions?